spooky. Oh shoot, is like my mic correct? Is my camera correct? Yes. Hi everyone. Always getting this wrong. I know we've been doing this for like two years, two and a half years. Uh, this is Melanie, <laughs> Melanie Yazi, co-host of uh, Red Power Hour. I am joined by my other co-host, Elena Ortiz. Would you like to say hello? Hello. I am calling in from uh, Ogapoge, otherwise known as Santa Fe or Mordor, where it's kind of overcast and gloomy, which I normally like, except I'd rather be taking a nap. <laughs> True, true words. I would rather be taking a nap than recording what we have to talk about right now. Um, yeah. yeah, not looking forward <laughs> to it. Kylie, um, speaking of Kylie, <laughs> we're joined by our comrade Kylie, uh, who has been on Red Power Hour several times, but is back for this uh, special review episode. Uh, you want to say hi, Kylie? Uh, yeah, Kylie here. And yeah, I'm super excited to get into this conversation today. <laughs> <laughs> that was so convincing. <laughs> <laughs> the funny thing is that we, we all saw this movie and like, I didn't think anything of it. Then I got home and I was like really grossed out and really depressed and like unhappy and i texted melanie and i said yeah I just saw wakanda forever ouch like ouch was what i said and then she texted me back she's yeah we saw it and like we started this whole conversation about and kylie saw it and every i mean we had a like this whole thing so many red nation comrades saw this movie and were like so disturbed by it and we just decided we had to do a podcast but it was almost like a like a, a hive mind response. Everybody was like, gross. So we have to talk about it. We have to take it apart. Uh, we have to deconstruct and we have to analyze and we're doing it all for you. Um, <laughs> falling on the sword. I got this <laughs> for, movie. for the people. <laughs> for the people, for the listeners. <laughs> we're so grateful that you are here and we hope we really that are. This will shed some light on how we all felt about this film because mm -hmm. I haven't seen anything from an indigenous perspective. And yeah. um, there's been a lot of positive reviews, which I just shake my head. Um, it's so, made over $1.3 billion. Yep. Whoa. Yeah. Wow. Yep. I'm assuming that's globally. Again, real quick, we're talking about the second Black Panther movie that came out like two weeks ago ish, a little over two weeks ago, Wakanda Forever. Uh, yeah, it cost two hundred and fifty million to make, so a quarter of a billion dollars, and then it has grossed as of now one point three four four billion dollars, uh, which matters. I think it matters in terms of the sheer number of people who are watching and consuming the political message of the movie. Uh, we're going to concentrate today on the political message of the movie. Uh, we all found it deeply disturbing, um, profoundly anti-Indian. And I'll describe why I think it's anti-Indian and not anti-Indigenous actually later on. But it's profoundly anti-Indian. And it's pretty much like the most anti-liberation <laughs> kind of um, uh, approach to politics I've seen in a long time. Um, and I understand that is maybe it's like a bit unfair to put like a different standard you know on this movie but i think it's just because the politics of the first black panther were really celebrated and for really good reason i think um just like the kind of like the beauty of a kind of african and indigenous uh, nationalism or nationhood that was allowed to develop you know in the absence of colonialism where like intelligence and um, innovation and ingenuity are celebrated, right? Um, because there's such like racist stereotypes in uh, you know popular culture about black and indigenous folks specifically, um, right? Is not having those things or like not having the the capacity or the the faculties um, that usually like white protagonists get to have uh, in these types of movies, and so. 
the community the, too. And the like community, I, the strength, the, the I don't different, know. The different um, tribes or clans that yeah. made up Wakanda in the first one and the community, how they felt about each other and celebrated each other was, was really uplifting. And we don't get that here. Yeah. And so I think, so I guess what I'm trying to say is really quick and then y'all can just jump in because we have so much to say um, in comparison to the first movie that I think politically was incredibly empowering because like any movie that's about futurism and so Black Panther, the first movie was definitely an Afrofuturist vision of what Black liberation or like what the what is possible in a world where oppression and like white supremacy and colonialism doesn't dominate every horizon of your existence and so that was really beautiful, right? To be able to see a world that was created, um, not really a kind of a utopia, but nevertheless, it allows you to like imagine what, what liberation or like what life might be like in the absence of this incredible structural violence we've experienced over the last 500 years, but then also what the future might look like, right? It was a very affirming, a very empowering, I think, movie about, about a lot of different things and Wakanda Forever was the exact opposite of that. And in fact, I think it's just like a, and it's profoundly counter-revolutionary. And so it just felt like a punch in the gut, I think for that reason, um, because the first one provided a politics of futurity and life and affirmation, um, whereas the second one was pretty much the opposite of that. But we can, we'll, we'll go into it. Um, I really hated it. <laughs> My review, I really, really did not like this movie. Uh, maybe we can talk here at the beginning of like how we felt watching the movie. Like Elena, you were saying that it wasn't until you went home that you felt the ouch moment. You know, whenever I'm like out in the world and I experience an act of racism, for example, I'm usually like, I usually like disassociate uh, or I kind of like, I'm in shock after it happens. And it's not usually till the end of that day or the next day that it really like sets in what happened. And then it just kind of like ruins my day. Sometimes it ruins my week, you know, like when the shock wears off or whatever, um, or the adrenaline wears off from those moments. That's pretty much how I felt during this film. I disassociated for a lot of it, um, especially once the indigenous characters appeared, because uh, it was like was super racist in the way it was portraying native or not native. Well, yes, native people, but indigenous people more broadly. Um, and then I left the theater kind of numb. And it wasn't until a little while later that I got really angry. <laughs> <laughs> but um kylie you want to talk a little bit about your experience as an indigenous person watching this film yeah oh gosh okay so this may be a little long-winded but um so in my conversations with other comrades about this movie i was like pointing out you know the release date of this movie was like during a very like contentious or like tumultuous time for indigenous people because like that week or that Monday November 9th was when we first started hearing the oral arg arguments of like supreme court judges for ICWA and that was live streamed and so I had listened to that prior and then also to just like so with that conversation um it sparked within like indigenous communities, what like sovereignty means to us, but also how like helped us to realize that like our sovereignty is actually very fragile, <laughs> you know, because with, um, you know, if ICWA is um, like taken away, then everything else is like in jeopardy. So land, water, like nationhood, everything. Um, so that was sort of on my mind before I had watched this movie. And then um, we had organizers who were gearing up for the Leonard Peltier March in DC that same week. Um, and then earlier in the year, you know, we had been um, thinking about like water. So there was the the uh, water crisis in Mississippi, Jack, or no, yeah, in Mississippi, and then, um, and then also too, there was like a lot of um, support and just a lot of like awareness um, 
in Oahu and their water systems and how the Navy, you know, is po- has been poisoning like their aquifer and their water for decades. <laughs> so I think just in general, you know, people are have been developing this sort of like consciousness and have been thinking about like where we are, like realistically in terms of like the climate crisis, um, water, our water systems. And uh, yeah, so all of those things were just kind of on my mind. And I had decided to go to, to the movies because movies for me are an escape. <laughs> They're kind of just a way for me to like turn off my mind for a little bit. Um, so I went and it was just, again, like I had to like sit through this movie and sort of like unpack everything that I had already been unpacking. Um, And then like, it just, like you said, it was just like a punch in the gut. It was very heartbreaking to have to receive that sort of messaging in our current like political landscape and it's like I, I I don't know how I don't have the right words to describe like how disturbing it is and then just knowing how much money it made and thinking about how many people saw that movie <laughs> is just so um like heartbreaking especially if they're they, they were an audience member who were making the same connections that I did uh it's just very um it doesn't put you in like a positive place. It doesn't, um, it sort of like shuts down any sort of like, imag- like, yeah, in any sort of like imaginative or like hopeful, um, hopeful, what's the word? Um, or I guess maybe any sort of hope that you have for the future. Cause in the first one, it does leave you sort of like you're you're open to imagine um what like a liberative future would look like or like what um like international like collaborations would look like you know so it kind of just leaves you free um but with this one i felt very contained or like I felt very um, imprisoned, I guess, which is exactly how I feel out in the real world is like, oh my God, (laughs) like I'm not allowed to have, I'm not allowed to be me, which is like an indigenous person. I'm not allowed to exist like freely as an indigenous person. So that's kind of how I felt leaving the movie. And I was just like, what the hell just happened? (laughs) Like, I, yeah, I kind of was just like in sort of like a whirlpool of confusion, of anger, of um, being like, like, I don't know. I just, I felt like I had to choose a side And I didn't like that feeling at all because, you know, like during the movie too, I was just like actively um, trying to like reject any, (laughs) any sort of like imperialist propaganda or like American propaganda. And so I think that kind of just put me in this weird like um, position or confusion of just like also having to like having to identify identify and just figure out like what the hell (laughs) like that's all yeah um but oh yeah I was just like in this whirlpool like for a long time after the movie and then um and I'm sure we'll talk about this later I'll unpack things a little bit more but it wasn't actually until after like a few days where I was just had to like clear my mind or like come to some sort of clarity and like analysis of the movie which I'm, I'm comfortable now like okay I know what this movie was about <laughs> uh, but yeah yep <laughs> yes all those things like feeling uh yeah Elena you had texted me ouch and it felt like a punch in the gut 
it also kind of felt like a knife in the heart, I guess, to me, more than a punch in the gut. Um, I almost had like a feeling of betrayal or something. Uh, so I was in shock at first and then confused. I think that's a good word to describe it, confused. And then kind of a feeling of betrayal uh, just because I I don't follow the Marvel universe. I So I don't really know about the introduction of the, the indigenous water nation, the Mayan water nation um, in Wakanda forever and like where that comes in the kind of the, the history of, of the Marvel universe. I don't care. <laughs> I don't care because the way that it was introduced and then portrayed in the movie was really, it didn't make any sense. Like I just didn't understand why, why those characters were there and like what purpose it served. You get what I'm saying? Even like narratively, not even politically. And then as soon as you find out that there's going to be this indigenous nation um, from originally from the Yucatan, they're Mayan. Um, then they go underwater and they're like a, a Mayan Atlantis kind of um, nation. They've been driven underground essentially because of colonialism, like the really violent kind of colonialism that the Spanish um, brought to Latin America. And so then I think as soon as they were introduced and then maybe just a few minutes in, I just, my, my stomach just dropped as soon as the indigenous characters were introduced. And I was like, please don't let this be what I think it's gonna be. And then it was, <laughs> and then it just went downhill from there. And from that point forward, I was literally like bracing myself in my seat. And I was just like, my teeth and my, my jaw was tight. And I was just watching all of this unfold and just watching like, like these black women protagonists of like Wakanda fighting this like indigenous nation that has had to go underground because of colonialism. And I'm like, why are these people fighting each other? And like, why are indigenous people being portrayed as these like irrational, like hyper radical um, separatists, I guess, in a way who just want to like destroy the world. And in comparison to like Wakanda, which is, you know, friendly <laughs> to, to imperialism and colonialism and is like seen and kind of cast as like the positive, like the good Indian kind of interpretation of what uh, an anti-colonial or like a type of nationhood that can develop a different type of nationhood developed in the context of pervasive imperialism and colonialism. And I don't know, even like the, the way that the indigenous people, the, the protagonist, his name is no amor, which means no love. Like uh, even like his, who he is as like a hero or like a demigod, um, it, it felt like a, like a mockery or a caricature. Like he has these really dumb wings <laughs> on his ankles and he has like pointed ears like an elf or something. And again, maybe this is written into the Marvel universe, but it was like, he was supposed to be this like very powerful, very powerful indigenous leader of this underground water, underwater water nation in Mayan indigenous water nation. But it was also just kind of like uh, unbelievable. And so then the entire movie from that point forward was just like kind of this incoherent um, series of like acts and counter acts between these protagonists, these black and indigenous protagonists. And it just didn't like, it just seemed unbelievable. And so I was like, why is, why, why is this the story of this movie? Like it almost felt, it felt like very disempowering for like all of the characters in the movie. It felt like they were all being portrayed as if they were acting out of revenge and spite and just emotion and grief. And I'm like, that is not what indigenous and black liberation is about. Yeah, grief, sure, like, you know, the of obviously, like, the violence of imperialism and colonialism has caused incredible trauma, you know, for our peoples intergenerationally, but, like, liberation is about strength, right? It's about, like, loving who you are and acting out of that place of strength. It's like the affirmation that your people will have a future. And instead, what this movie was was a bunch of, like, liberal individuals 
who were just like um like fighting with each other online <laughs> like, and just kind of how the movie felt and i really hated it because it reduced the beautiful like incredible hard-won struggles that our peoples have take undertaken historically and and right now it just basically reduced them to like liberal infighting or like the tokenizing gesture of identity politics and that was like probably the most insulting thing to me in the movie that and then like just like the weird caricature of indigenous people and i don't know yeah the caricature of the of namor <clears throat> and actually all of talakan which is the the underwater city and the people were it was it was it was incoherent um, you didn't know what they were trying to portray. You kind of figured out that it was, you know, an indigenous sort of pseudo Mayan kind of thing, but it was so incoherent that it, it was frustrating to see, to watch them. And then to like the first, well, there's a lot of thoughts that went through my head, but the first one I think was, wait, are these people going to fight each other? Are they going to be enemies like the Wakandans and the Talakans? So what, like, why are the brown people fighting the black people? Like that was the first major kind of like head snap that, that I had while watching it. And then I settled in to realize I'm going to hate this movie. So I'm just going to try to like take in what I can and notice what I can and the second thing after um, the Talakan, like being really confused about what they were, was the women who um, had in the first movie seemed so, um, I don't know a word for it, like Okoye, who is the head of the, the female um, army, and Shuri, who was like this incredibly brilliant inventor and created all of these things. Um, and even Ra Rwanda, Rwanda was the mom, the queen, um, were like very positive, very sort of uplifting characters. And in this movie, they just were all like subjected to this bougie liberal like infighting and the women fought with each other they 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 didn't stand up for each other there was not you know any sense of cohesiveness or or community so it, that was super depressing and so there was a lot of misogyny there was a lot of anti-indianness and there was a lot of anti-blackness and it was exactly what melanie said like it was an anti-liberation movement it sort of negated everything that was feel good about the first movie and and made it into this like wakanda can only survive if they accept imperialism and accept liberalism and accept colonization because clearly Talakan is is going to be an enemy and they need the u.s to help fight this enemy and it just it it, it got it just got so icky and, and so depressing. And then it just kept like kept reinforcing that throughout the whole film with every female character, the, the young student who's at MIT and she's um, invented all these amazing things. And yet she's making her money by selling test scores or doing tests for this white jock character. And then she becomes, um, they have to take her and then she becomes a sort of fangirl for the Wakandans, which is is very disturbing also. But yeah, it was it was just uh it was almost like trying to get through it, noticing as many things as I could that were awful. Like a, a notepad in my brain going, Oh, that's fucked up. And that's <laughs> fucked up. And that's fucked up. And then I got and then I got out of it. I was like, Yeah, that was way worse than I thought it was going to be. I mean, it started out, I was thinking this is bad. And then when I walked out, I was like, oh, it was even worse than I thought it was going to be. So yeah, it was super depressing. Oh, God. Yeah. What I also just, oh my gosh. 
That's exactly it, Elena. It was literally like, yeah, like checking off all the fucked up things. <laughs> oh my God. Like, okay. So another thing that I wanted to point out too about this movie is, okay, so what I didn't like was that I kept hoping for some sort of redemption and it never came. And that was probably the most disappointing thing. It's just, you're literally just in a whirlpool forever. And there's just like no way of getting out of it. But also, um, what's like, what kept sticking out to me is um, sort of like the, the way that Americans and like CIA are f framed in this movie which is very like friendly very like cutesy funny they 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 bring like comedic relief um and then it's like move forward to like these indigenous nations that can't you know protect themselves they um are infighting like you said and they can't agree on their resources. Um, yeah, which are all tropes. Like, they're all... Um, uh, yeah, I, but anyway, okay. So, with that in mind, it's like, as an audience, you're supposed... Like, you're forced to choose sides. Like, you're forced to choose between, like, the good and the bad. And somehow, the Americans don't have anything to do with that <laughs> you know they fall into the background and um we're supposed to like refer to them as like our favorite colonizers which i will never ever do like liberalism takes everything but they're not going to take that word away from us <laughs> like i will always identify my enemies as like the colonizers as settlers because in reality they're hoarding wealth they're stealing land um they're imprisoning our people Leonard Peltier like the FBI CIA the U.S. is responsible for the injustices of Leonard Peltier and just like oh uh, yeah anyway so I just want to say that like do not ever like turn colonizer or settler into an affectionate term <laughs> that's never going to be a term of endearment damn it <laughs> um anyway so that was also what made me so uncomfortable about this movie is that it's such a false um, like representation of like everybody in it, especially the Americans. Like that's so disturbing to me that they would um, sort of like change this narrative or like redefine like the CIA or like the U.S. government as like this cutesy friendly entity when it's not. <laughs> And in reality, like, if Wakanda existed, like, the U.S. would be planning, like, a coup, like, to take Vibranium or to, like, um, force Wakanda, like, into submission or, like, take away their sovereignty, take away their their resources and their wealth. Like, <laughs> that, you know, so I just, like, could not believe, like, just how much the U.S. propaganda is in this film and the like reframing of their position as like like this I don't know in a way it's like kind of trying to I don't like I guess maybe like I don't know if disarm is the right word or to like encourage oppressed peoples and colonized people to like let their guard down like you know America's not that bad like you know, <laughs> we're not this, like, powerful, like, global dominating country, like, this death machine. We're not that. Like, look at these people. They're funny. <laughs> they can have good relations with other, you know, it's just so, I, I can't believe it. it. I could not, that's, like, one thing I was not letting go of, like, in this movie was just, like, I don't believe it for a second. Like, I'm not taking this U.S. propaganda like, oh, God, please just erase it from my memory.
like there's like the good CIA and the bad CIA because there's like, you know, at the beginning of the movie, Angela Bassett, who plays the queen of Wakanda, is at the UN. And you find out there's like this scene, right, where the French have sent in a covert, their version, I'm assuming, of the CIA or whatever operation to steal vibranium from a Wakandan facility where I, I forgot where it was, you know, and then she like hauls all of the the paramilitary dudes, the special ops, the French special ops dudes in. And she, you know, she like confronts the French president or whoever that person is on representing France at the UN. And she's like, don't do this, you know? And so then there are parts of the CIA that are trying to get vibranium through like the sneaky U S Imperial maneuvers, right? The cooey kind of aspects, but you have Julia Louis-Dreyfus and then, you know, Elena, you pointed out, I, I, I don't actually remember his name. Um, it's the British actor who plays Bilbo <laughs> in the Hobbit. Um, right. And so you have these kind of like friendly, like the friendly faces of the CIA, which actually has always bothered me about Marvel movies. That's why Iron Man is my least favorite in the entire Marvel universe. Cause Iron Man is played by what's his face. Um, I was going to say Robert Redford. It's not Robert Downey Jr. <laughs> Robert Redford. And he's also kind of like small in stature. He's like really funny, right? He's like very likable. He's like a charismatic character, um, but he's just like a stand for the U.S. Army, you know, the U.S. military and the U.S. imperialism and most Marvel characters are in general. Um, and so this one is also positioning like Wakanda as making an evaluation between who's like the good CIA and the bad CIA. And these are like the good colonizers. And then you have um, the underwater nation to, 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 to Tolkien's Talek, Talek, what? Talakan. Talakan. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the Talakan who are, they're like, these motherfuckers are our enemy. Like they are not our friends. None of them are good you know, they will never stop coming for us. And so there is, there is like a type of anti-colonial politics in there that does have a standard, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like knowing who the enemy is and being willing to act to like protect, you know, to not just protect one's nation, but protect the water and to protect the land. Um, and not just for themselves, but for like, you know, humanity and for the sake of the planet. And so that does exist in the film, but it's portrayed as like the bad Indians. It's like the bad Indians are the ones who don't know how to make friends with the good colonizers. And that's what feels really racist <laughs> about and really anti-liberation. It's like basically mocking and then, you know, speaking of liberation struggles, black indigenous liberation struggles historically that have been deeply and militantly you know, anti-colonial um, or anti-racist or anti-capitalist or anti-imperial and then like portraying them with derision or almost like mockery. And that's why I was bringing up like the dumb wings on Neo Nordmore's legs or his ankles and then the, the little wing tip ears or whatever. It almost feels like a mockery of a kind of like strong anti-colonial liberation formation. Um, and those, it, and so it's like, okay, so you're mocking liberation you're just mocking liberation you're mocking the gesture and the necessity of solidarity between people of the global south um we need to talk more about like that this is a very american interpretation also, also of like what constitutes liberation politics in the global south which makes it a deeply imperialist movie just like the unconscious of the movie is deeply imperialist because it's very american exceptionalist is very u.s centric we don't need to go into that right now, but I'm just rambling now. But I wanted to say one other thing before I pass it back to y'all that's sort of related to this. I think my I, my initial thought in like the hours after watching the movie, while I was watching the movie and then the days, um, I'm two weeks out from it. So I feel, I think a little bit differently. I just, I felt like um, the movie was like very purposefully either derisive or I don't know, like uh, I'm going to use the word mocking again, making a mockery of indigenous nationhood or like water protectors or, um, you know, like what are usually construed as the more radical, like bad Indian, like militant formations of indigenous liberation. And it felt very intentional to me. Like it was belligerent. Actually, the word I kept thinking of in my mind was like, it was like belligerent the way that the indigenous water nation was portrayed as like the bad Indians. And I still think that that's true. But now that I'm looking back like at the film kind of globally from a larger perspective, 
I actually feel like the film was making a mockery and also being incredibly derisive of pretty much like all of the pillars of our contemporary liberation formations, not just for indigenous people, but for like black liberation too. So it's like making fun of, um, or kind of making it seem like an impossibility for like um, black nations or African nations in Africa or like indigenous nations in Latin America, right? The global South to even have any type of liberation without collaborating with US imperialism. So it's making it seem like anti-imperialism is an impossibility, but like the people who are interested or like advocate for anti-imperialism, it's like, it's already a lost cause or like, it's just laughable. It's kind of like the butt of a joke. And that was like deeply offensive, but it's also like making a mockery of water protectors. You had made a great commentary about this. It kind of makes a mockery of like black feminism or like radical black feminism. It makes a mockery of Afro and indigenous futurisms. It makes a mockery of international solidarity. It makes a mockery of indigenous nationhood and indigenous nationalism. And it makes a mockery of black liberation struggles too. And so now I'm realizing that it's not just treating like indigenous characters this way. It's also treating like all of the characters this way. And they're not characters. It's like the movie isn't just about characters. It's like a reflection of our political present, right? And this kind of reflection of like, this is really what people think about what constitutes liberation. That is deeply disturbing to me. And it like doesn't reflect where a lot of people are at in 2022. And the fact that the three of us here like belong to the Red Nation and we're constantly struggling for indigenous liberation and we reject, we categorically reject all of the, the liberal kind of like overtures in the film, which I'm sure is why it felt like we were, were rejecting the film as we were watching it, because that's really what's presented to us here. We're presented with no alternative. It's like, we're going to make a mockery of all of these things and basically make it seem laughable that, and, that liberation is even possible, which is basically the takeaway from this movie. And that's just like a historical liberal trash, you know, from my perspective. And no wonder you walk away feeling confused and like you're in a whirlpool. There's nothing empowering about that. Liberation empowers us, right? It empowers us. It makes us feel like we have a future. It gives us hope. You were using that term hope, Kylie. And this future was like the opposite. I mean, this movie was the opposite of that. Yeah, there was a, the, what you said, Melanie, like the, there was this sort of subtext of um, the Talakan, um quest for um or against colonization. You see that in the very beginning. And then you take this sharp turn to them attacking Wakanda. So it looks like what they're saying is that the only way to achieve um, a, a, um, a future without colonization, without imperialism, the only way to protect the water and to protect their sovereignty is to attack another nation that is also struggling with the same things. And it, it just took this turn into um, basically ensuring that the brown and black people were going to fight one another and not the true enemy, which is colonialism and imperialism and capitalism and destruction of, of you know, our home planet. And so it was like, that's how we're going to distract you from the real um, issues. The real enemy is by having Telecon fighting um, Wakanda. And we'll throw all these cute little CIA agents in there so that you won't be afraid of them. And you won't think about the fact that the CIA is largely responsible for, um, you know, one of the, the, the greatest um, Mayan um, nations, which is also called Guatemala, and the CIA was the one who who created a coup and, and installed an American um, capitalist dictator, American sponsored capitalist dictator down there, and they really are the enemy. The CIA really is the enemy. It's not Bilbo Baggins, and it's not Veep. It's it's real world struggles against the CIA, which is just the strong arm 
of U.S. imperialism and U.S. capitalism and U.S. colonization. So I think that's why we all ended up so confused because like we understand what the reality on the ground is and what, what the reality on the ground bears no resemblance to what was shown on this film. And it just like, and I keep going back to what Kylie said, like the whirlpool, you feel like you're just being swirled around, swirled around. And then at the end of the movie, you just go down the drain and you're not quite sure where you end up. Exactly. And um, I like that, how you brought up Melanie, that this is also a reflection of, you know, where we are <laughs> um, politically and just how people think of liberation and like indigenous nationhood oh gosh because like oh one thing to um so there are so i have so many blank spots <laughs> for this movie because there there was just portions of it where yeah like i did i just disassociated and uh, yeah i was just like this is just too much being thrown at me at once but uh, so I'm I'm sort of just speaking to what I remember and what um, stuck out to me the most. And so just thinking in the context of, um, I can't pronounce their name, so I'm just going to call them water people, <laughs> the water nation. But yeah, so like, like we had discussed earlier, they had moved into the ocean to escape colonialism and like ensure their survival as a nation. So their like nation is underwater and it's also found that they have like vibranium and so they're protecting the ocean um, and their nation from resource extraction. And um, the scene where I can't exactly remember what's going on or like what had just happened, but there's a scene where... Um, there's like a ship, um, but it belongs to Wakanda or it came from Wakanda. And um, so all of the water people are like surrounding the ship and they're like at, they come up to the surface. And so they're like still in the water, but all you can see is like their shoulders and uh, on up. And so it kind of shows that scene. And then like the camera pans out. And so you see all of the like airplanes and the helicopters like surrounding the water people and they're just like dropping bombs and they're using like sonar sonar technology to like mess with their their like cognition or just to kind of like confuse them. <clears throat> but when I saw that scene, just like immediately, I thought of Standing Rock and how the police and um, like how the police had positioned themselves on top of like the, this hill. And at the bottom of the hill, like literally the water protectors were standing in the river, like protecting their land and protecting the water. And I just could not like shake that like parallel <laughs> because it was just so like like just so um what's the like I don't know it's just so vol visceral like it's just so in your face like how can you not um make that connection and like I said earlier it's just very intentional so it, it kind of made me think of like okay like who else had their hands in making this movie and there's no way that like they could not be aware of these movements. <laughs> like there's no way like, um, and also to just thinking about like how anti-Indianism is so prevalent in this country and it sort of like works um, with liberalism. Right. So like um, I think to me, it just seemed like another trope or just like, building upon um like tropes of indigenous people like historically in film um where it's like 
our our struggles, our identity, just like who we are as like native people politically has always been for the taking. Um whether it's like land or uh land, water, sovereignty, nationhood, um even our own like quote unquote like representation it's all for the taking <laughs> and so i feel like that's what this film was doing in terms of like our struggles and what we're up against and how we're defending ourselves um from like these entities like the police or the military or just like the whole usa <laughs> like um, and then so it was sort of just like consumed like in this movie and then like regurgitated into another trope and like another mockery for like entertainment. And oh, I just I just oh, gosh, it just makes me so upset. Like, I, I hate it so much. <laughs> yeah, I mean, to build off of what you were saying you know, about Standing Rock, Kylie, and like the scene that the iconic, it wasn't a scene, it was something that actually happened on more than one occasion, where the police were throwing tear gas and like water, you know, water protectors in the river when they were on top of the hill, that was the Cannonball River going into the, the Missouri River. And like, I remember the scene, the first time when it got it got really cold, I think that November, um, up at up at camp. And the live scenes that were being streamed on Facebook by grassroots media people of all of those cops and like those militarized cops on top of the tanks. Do you remember this right at the line on the highway? I forgot what the highway was. That was very reminiscent. Um, well, the, the Wakandan craft, the, 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 the ship you're talking about was very like angular, right? It looked like a tank. It looked like a tank, but in water, and it was that scene was very reminiscent, I think, of the scene from Standing Rock that I remember where there was that entire line of militarized cops and they were spraying people. They were spraying water protectors, even though it was like sub-zero. They took people's eyes out that night. Um, they were shooting bullets at people, rubber bullets. Um, I think that was the night that that water protector lost her eye to a bullet. People were bleeding. People, Several people went into cardiac arrest that night at Standing Rock. Um, and that is what that scene reminded me of. And I think the reason why I'm bringing that up uh, is because I remember like, remember when Trump was elected in 2016? And do you remember like the show Handmaid's Tale came out that same year, the next year? Do you remember this? And Handmaid's Tale is basically about like a, a hyper conservative revolution that happens in the United States. And then it becomes, I forget what the Republic is called, but it's based on like misogyny, um, and like really profound violence against women, like uh, an authoritarianism that is premised on misogyny. And I remember when I first watched, I watched the first season of that show was the first year of Trump's presidency. And I was like, I was, I was traumied out watching that show as a woman, as a woman, because I was like, oh my God, this is actually happening right now. And I'm sure that they timed it in that way to kind of like reflect the political reality of that particular moment. The reason why I'm saying this is because I feel like like the Wakanda Forever also came out. You were talking about the week that it came out, but it's coming out in a particular political moment where I felt super traumied out by the movie because like what the movie was portraying is actually happening in real time. And there are references in the movie, like the scenes from Standing Rock, you know, that that happens like when Wakanda, you know, is is battling and brutalizing the indigenous water nation those things are actually plucked from reality, the reality in like the struggles that we have been participating in, in the last like five, five to 10 years. And so it's not just a movie, right? It's not just like a, it's not just a Marvel movie. It's a movie that is very intentionally like commenting on the present and representing and, and presenting itself as something that very much belongs to our present political condition in our present political moment. And so that's why the movie felt really real to me. And maybe that's why my expectation was a little bit different with this film too, because it seems very intentional that it is plucking 
right, these moments out of the reality of liberation front lines. But then, like you said, what it does with it through like the politics of representation, it distorts it and regurgitates it as this trash, this liberal trash. And then, you know, like, uh, and then where the movie leaves you is so, I think a lot of people are in that place. I think liberals are in that place. Like people who are really obsessed with like politics online are probably in this place of infighting because I see it happen all the time, especially between like, like black political communities and indigenous political communities. But that is not where everyone is at. The people who are on front lines and people who are doing work on the ground and in other spaces do not live their lives online. And like in this, like this realm of, I, I don't know, like this counter revolutionary kind of pessimistic realm where it's like, we're never gonna have a future because we're just fighting with each other all the time. That does exist in a particular realm at the moment, but that certainly isn't like, that doesn't define like how everyone kind of feels or is approaching things. And so it's like the movie is like a, it's a fictional account, but it also has like a very real impact and a real, like a real negative impact, I would say, on like what our political possibilities are for, for movement building in this particular moment. And that is what's really dangerous <laughs> about this movie. And the fact that so many people have seen it. Yeah, I think back to this um, commercial that I saw, you know, we're getting all of the holiday commercials and there was a commercial and I don't even know what it was for, but it was a little girl dressed up um, like a Wakandan and um, they had the store that she was shopping at with her mother, they had the beads and she wanted the beads. I think it was a credit card commercial and they, so she was able to get these, she was able to consume these beads um, as part of American consumer culture. And um, she was able to have them. So she was able to buy um, this token um, of, of this film. And it was just really disturbing because I just wonder why people think that the characters portrayed in this movie are suitable um, to be idolized by children. And I haven't read too much. I actually went into this movie not really understanding that there was going to be an indigenous um, representation. Like I hadn't read anything about it. I was just kind of looking like Kylie. I go to movies sort of as, as an escape to stop thinking for a couple of hours. And I was really excited just to see, because I always thought Shuri was kind of a cool character and she was fun and she was hip, you know, and she was a tough chick and like, you know, super cool. And I thought it was just going to be an enjoyable two hours and so as I started watching it and got, you know, such horrible, horrible um, messaging coming from this film. Um, and then I, after I rested my mind for a couple of days, I started reading some of the um, online comments about it and a lot of really positive comments about representation and to me, that was really horrifying because I don't think there was any positive representation of anyone in this, in this film. And, um, there's, a, yeah, there is a lot of identity politics, um, around the indigenous characters. Like really, who are they? What are they? Where do they come from? Are they Mayan? Are they Aztec? Are they like people we've never heard of with winged feet and, you know, pointy ears? Is it Satan? Is it like a representation of the, of the uh, Christian Satan? Um, and like, I don't, I don't know what they were aiming for, but whatever the writers were aiming for, they didn't get anything right. And they certainly didn't represent Chicano, Latino, um, Latinx, um, Mayan, global South indigenous nations well at all. They were not, they were the enemy. They were, 
they were, you know, represented as the enemy, although, you know, they were water protectors. Um, but they were, they were aggressively belligerent. Melanie used that word too. And I remember that word coming to my mind. They like, why did they go after Wakanda in, in the first place in a belligerent manner? And not just say, hey, we have a common enemy. Like, let's get together and fight. Like, there was never any of that. You know, it wasn't like they approached Wakanda and Wakanda said, no, we're isolationist. We're not going to play ball with you. It was like, literally, they were belligerent from, from the very get-go. And so I didn't find anything positive or anything redeemable about any of the characters, from Namor to his sister or to any of the um, the water tribe. And then the Wakandans, um, like, really sort of fell apart. Like their their um, independence and their their liberatory struggles were non-existent. They were all consumed with this individuality. Like with Shuri, it was, I have to, you know, I have to, um, to take this medicine so that I can become the Black Panther and um, and take my place, take my brother's place, take my place. And yet <clears throat> it's all about her traumas and about her getting to that place. And when she sees Killmonger, instead of who she wanted to see, it's like, she's disappointed that this is who the ancestors sent her. Get over yourself. Like you need to protect your community and your people. And there was no, and Kylie, you said this too. There was like no redemption arc. For any of the characters, they were just all bad. And so I, I, I can't imagine, like, <clears throat> you've got a child and, and they want to, you know, be, they want to dress up as Shuri. What are you telling your child? Like, what values are you elevating for your child that you want this to be their, their idol? It just, it, I, I didn't get it. And, and I, I have to say a lot of, at least the, uh, the indigenous people that I read um, who were praising this movie for the representation, they were all men. And so dudes really seem to like the winged feet and the pointy ears. I'm not quite sure why, but hmm, I wonder what that means. <laughs> This is, this is peak representation, po politics of representation, or like recognition. This is like, this is the logical conclusion of a politics, of a liberal politics of recognition, where it's like, you're just representing, you're just putting like black women into these characters. And it's kind of like these characters are just receptacles for representation or tokenization, essentially, or like you're including indigenous nationhood and because what liberal identity politics does is it creates the liberal individual, which is one of the building blocks. Sorry, I'm going to go into my academic explanation. But like the liberal individual, which is one of the building blocks of like liberal societies like the United States, for example. And then the, the idea, the logic of race, which creates a hierarchy, right, a hierarchy of value that's assigned um, where some people, some human beings, but then also certain forms of life. Right. Whether they're animals or plants or the earth itself are given value according to their class, right? There's a, high, a class hierarchy that's built into liberal ideology. And then the liberal individual becomes this kind of like measuring mechanism for like, it's the receptacle. It's essentially, a, what, what would they call it in post-structuralism? It's like an empty signifier. It's a receptacle that you can invest with certain attributes to do the work of this like class and racial hierarchy. And so today, I've talked about this in relationship to the pretendianism stuff, right? Today, because we live in a neoliberal multicultural society where liberalism has taken on this like gesture of diversity, equity, and inclusion, right? Where the gesture of inclusion means you get to include people, a tokenized few people into like a hall of power, whether it's like a powerful political position or you're giving them more money to make movies like this or reservation dogs, you know, or those kinds of things. And so the gesture of inclusion means that you're giving somebody resources for their identity, right? And so the liberal individual receptacle under a neoliberal multicultural order is one in which like more diversity and like more inclusion of more diverse identities becomes 
like the the commodity, it becomes the way in which like liberalism re-expresses itself and regurgitates itself, right? To renormalize itself when it's being challenged for for its racism, right? When it's being challenged for the prior kind of iterations of like the receptacle of liberal individualism that has usually and still today pretty much just been invested with like heteropatriarchy and white supremacy and like a property bearing, like the property bearing white settler male, for example, in a place like the United States. And so it's tricky because it can play, it can be invested with different identity attributes, but it's still just at the end of the day, the empty signifier, Jody Bird calls it the zombie, zombie imperialism. It's still just a zombie, no matter what kind of character, the color of their skin, the language that they're speaking that you put into the zombie, it's still just a zombie. And so the movie is literally just filled with a bunch of zombies. It's like identity is purely, it's like purely tokenized because if it weren't, if it weren't just a zombie, then there would be actual politics to the movie that wasn't just liberalism. It wasn't just the dead end of liberalism. Because like I said, that like zombie receptacle, it'll just keep reinventing itself over and over and over again to smooth over any kind of challenge to like the original class hierarchy that that drives the entire system of liberalism that liberalism relies upon. And so I think we've already done a pretty good job, I think kind of pointing out and analyzing that the movie doesn't actually have politics. It's like the anti-politics, it's like anti-liberation. And so my the only conclusion that I can draw is that it's just pure liberal individualism, which is also why it's a very, the plot of the film is very incoherent as well, because it's basically just a bunch of individuals, whether or not they're like black women, you know, who are trying to lead Wakanda, or they're like an indigenous man who's trying to lead, you know, the indigenous water nation. They're literally just individuals who are being motivated by their individual traumas right? Their grief, their revenge or whatever. And then they just like fight with each other. And then like nothing gets resolved. There's no politics whatsoever. It's literally just like individual motivations. And it's just a bunch of individuals. I don't know, just like running amok and just making really poor choices. <laughs> basically. And then there's no explanation about like what motivates them other than their individualism. And so that's why I think that this is like peak liberalism. I know it represents where a lot of people are at. I know I have this analysis because I watch, like I watch how people act online. A lot of this shit happens and unfolds online. There's a reason why pretendianism is a thing because I think pretendianism very much participates in this liberal identity politics, the zombie imperialism, you know, that I was talking about, but this film definitely does that too. And that's, that's not politics. Liberalism is the political ideology that made like capitalism and white supremacy and imperialism possible. <laughs> in the 17th century and like we need to abolish that shit and we need to get out of whatever the whatever world that that creates for us because it makes us think that this is like the path or like somehow this is all that's possible that's what liberalism does it makes us like you said it's a container kylie you felt contained like it literally like imprisons us in our own minds to think that our identities are the most important things and like somehow if we like express our identities more or we get more inclusion or we put on our power suit or like the black panther suit and we like act like a man as a woman like somehow that's going to liberate us that's not that is not what liberation means lib liberalism and liberation have the same root term lib but they do not mean the same thing and i'm so fucking sick <laughs> of liberalism because it God, destroys everything in the United States and Americans are so like unaware, like they're like militantly, like purposefully unaware of like how liberal their politics are. And then they export it to the rest of the world. That's the other thing. I'm sorry, I'm just going off now. I'm just so pissed off. <laughs> it's like, that's the other thing that really pisses me off about this movie is that it takes this like the liberal unconscious of American racial politics, true, really, that's what it does. And then it, like imposes that on the global South. Wakanda's in Africa. Like the water nation is in like Latin America, right? These are, these are nations that have been trying to liberate themselves from European and American imperialism for, for centuries. And you're gonna take your like American exceptionalist bullshit and then you're just gonna export that. And then you're gonna subject 
these like actual national liberation struggles, the, like actual revolutionary struggles to this like stupid shit online, like the way people behave on social, on Twitter, like what is wrong with you? That's just another type of imperialism. And like imperialism happens through sanctions. It can happen through the CIA. It certainly happens through culture. And what is more effective in spreading this imperialist agenda that you're talking about, Kylie, than like through popular culture, through movies, through the Marvel universe, right? And then you're just like renormalizing this nonsense everywhere. And you're also like silencing. You're silencing like the beautiful, really difficult struggles that people, black people and indigenous people and women and like LGBTQ folks and water protectors and land defenders are like the struggles that they're actually waging in the global South. Cause they're not out here tokenizing themselves and engaging in liberalism. They're rejecting it and they're building the alternative that's gonna fucking save us all. The alternative is definitely not gonna come out of the United States. I'm so sick of like the navel gazing and just like the conceit of, of US politics when it comes to like movements. And that's really what I feel that this movie does.